Ravin Rais, Professor Kevin Krostin, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and all participants. I, Mrs. Gauri Gothiwrekar, welcome you all for the Library Technology Conclave, LTC 2022, jointly organized by Informatics, Somaya Vidya Vihar, and Somaya Vidya Vihar University. For the first workshop, we are delighted to have Ms. Robin Rice as our resource person. Ms. Robin is working as data librarian and head of research data support information services, University of Edinburgh, UK. Ms. Robin has authored the book, The Data Librarian, in collaboration with Mr. John Southall. Now I request Ms. Robin to begin the session. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, thank you for waiting for the start of the workshop. Thank you, welcome. Uh, so you've heard the introduction about me. I, I've been a data librarian. I talk very loud, so I'll probably turn it down. Um, I've been a data librarian for a long time, since the previous century. <laughs> and uh, so you can ask me anything. But um, uh, I've, uh, since um, 1998, actually, I've been working at University of Edinburgh. I'm originally from the US. Uh, I have a library degree from the University of Wisconsin. I started doing li data librarianship there. And uh, I used to roll over big nine track tapes. So I don't go f as far back as punch cards, but I do go back as far as big magnetic tapes on mainframe computers. Um, oh, thank you. That's perfect. How, how are we doing with the sound? It sounds loud. Uh, yes, so at the University of Edinburgh, um, I run a team of research data support and um, I'm service owner for the research data service, which is a collaboration between uh, the library and the IT department. Oh. Uh, Mr. Darshan is there inside. I mean, Just they, help, ma'am. Uh, so my first slide when it comes is a picture of uh, Edinburgh University Main Library building. And uh, I was going to say, um, thank you. Okay, we'll use the mouse. Uh, so that's, that's Edinburgh. I, I arrived here on um, Saturday morning, so I, I'm very uh, acclimatized to Mumbai. I think in, in Edinburgh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know the temperature today, I forgot to look it up, but in the summertime, it's about 15 degrees. <laughs> and so uh, it's, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting all my summer in one week here um, be, before I go back and put on a jacket. Uh, it's very nice to be here in, in Mumbai. I've been all, I've been through all the, maybe not all the sites, but I've been to a lot of sites. I went to Elephanta Island the other day. It's very nice. If you haven't been there, make time to go. Um, okay, so the icebreaker. This is just to find out a bit about you all and um, a little bit about what your, where you're coming from. So if I can get the internet, the idea here is have, has anyone ever used Mentimeter before? Oh, internet. So we're going to do an online poll. So if you have a device, a phone or a laptop, either one. Um, uh, let, I just need to I just need to log in on my side and then um, start, start the poll, and then I'll give you a code, and you log in 
and you can answer the questions. It's, it's not that complicated. Uh, it's, uh, don't, we don't have instructions yet. I have to do my part. It's okay. If you have to type in your password in front of an audience, this is what happens. I forgot I used my personal email for that. Okay. Okay. Live polling. Um, if you go to www.menti.com and use that code um, to log in, and then you can answer the question. Uh, 7304-8504. Okay, it's working. Somebody's from engineering and computer science, so we'll just give you a little time to get logged in. So it's, it's www.menti.com. Is anyone having any trouble finding the website or the code? It's a little small. I'll read out the number again. 7304-8504. So we're going to use this a couple of times, so this gives you practice. Okay, it looks like we have uh, a lot of uh, Humanities represented, not so much uh, physical scientists here today. Not so much social sciences here today. A lot of librarians, right? But we also have uh, experts in business and management and engineering or computer science. And some of you may be librarians too, because I don't know how you chose to answer the question. Okay, is everybody happy with that or is there anybody still trying to find it? Anybody still trying to find menti.com? Okay, everybody's happy? Okay, so now we all know kind of where each other's coming from for this. 
And now um, a question about research data management. Just one, don't worry. Uh, well, it's three questions on one slide. So I'm wondering, this is called the RDM Basics Workshop. So I'm wondering how, uh, how much you feel like you already know about research data management. and how confident you are. So just answer the th three questions. It should be the same code. Um, well, hopefully, if you're already logged in, you'll just see the next slide. Oh, thank you. OK, thanks. OK, they're starting to come. So on the left side, if, when, if you have less knowledge, on the right side, if you feel you have more knowledge, So I've worded the question for whether you're a researcher or a librarian. So if you're a librarian, you're supporting the researchers, then you understand why RDM is important for your researchers. Um, if you're the researcher, you may or may not feel RDM is, is so important, or it is, but you're here today, so you feel it's somewhat important. So I think this one doesn't tell us how many, how many people have done it yet. So I'll just give it another few seconds. Does it? Oh, 23 people. OK. OK, so everybody did that quite quickly. OK, so we'll just, um, we'll just make a note of that. So it makes sense. People are here today because they feel it, a majority of people uh, feel it's quite important, Not um, a little bit less familiar, so here to take a workshop. And on data management planning, sorry, I used some jargon there. DMP is data management planning, but you might know that. Um, and you either feel confident or you do not about writing a data management plan or advising others on a data management plan. So, so everyone has uh, room for improvement, so that's good. So now back to the PowerPoint. Okay. And uh, you can be my timekeeper when it's time for the break. Uh, or, or Shalini, will, uh, Dr. Ors will, will tell me when to stop talking. So I want to make sure you all get your coffee, tea break. Okay, 11.10. Yeah, so we have one hour to whip through a lot of uh, material. So we saw the live results. So, so this is, these are the topics I thought would be useful to cover. Um, basics, start at the beginning, start with the definitions, unpack what we're talking about a little bit, um, and then more about why we're doing it. You probably have a lot of background in this already, the drivers for RDM, why are we doing why are we doing this? Um, which I've broken down into three categories of open science, research integrity, along with reproducibility, and the, and the benefits for the researcher themselves. Um, then we'll do a bit about data management planning. Then so just a very few slides about some nitty gritty stuff, but there's, there's ways to learn more about the nitty gritty stuff, you know, organizing the data and the files, but, um, Documentation, metadata code, RDM tools, such as electronic lab notebooks, is what I'm thinking there, uh, computer, uh, digital notebooks, um, open data licenses and data citation, um, and then towards the FAIR principles. Uh, show of hands, so who's heard of FAIR? Okay, the other instructor <laughs> and, and this gentleman. Okay, great. So. There's more, more, that's an acronym, which um, I might as well say now, but we'll talk about it again. Uh, it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so data and metadata to be, um, to make your data fair is what we say. And, uh, that, I didn't make that up, um, but we'll have some references on those slides. Data security and data protection, if we can get that far, 
If not, um, if we don't manage to get through all the slides today, uh, we'll, we'll make sure they're available for email circulation so you can have them afterwards. And, and also you don't have to take all the notes because you can have the slides if you want. Um, and then if we have time, a little bit of discussion about the differences with different disciplines. Um, so research data. Uh, so I say research data are, not is, um, are digital objects or entities that are collected, observed, created, or reused to produce, validate, and enrich research findings and conclusions. Uh, so research data includes um, the original information collected, or you might hear, use the term raw data. Uh, usually whenever someone uses the term raw data, a debate ensues about what is raw data and what is not raw data. Um, so I avoid that, but uh, usually data is transformed in some way coming from when it was originally collected. So transformed or original uh, information created by researchers. It, it might be numeric data, it might not. It helps to have definitions especially when you're talking to researchers and they say, I do research, but I don't have any data. Well, you can say, do you have any of these things? Um, because if you do, then you probably do have data that needs to be managed. So you're not getting off the hook that easy. So you have to make up your mind whether research data are singular or not. Uh, you know, the Star Trek character data, I, I was going to put a picture of him in there, but I forgot to do that. Um, so I just have a couple of cartoons here and there. Um, what do you think? Data R? Raise your hand if you like data R. Who likes data is? Neutral? Data is? End of sentence? What do you think? Okay, you'll hear it both ways. Um, it's becoming common to use both ways. I, I think my personal opinion is people say data is when they're, they don't know what the data, they're just talking about data in the abstract. So librarians use that a lot. They'll say, um, um, bring, your, bring your own data to the workshop. Um, the, the data is uh, important to bring to the workshop. But if, if you're a researcher and you're saying these data show, my data show that this is true or that you know, my hypothesis plays out, then you might say these data, you might say plural. Uh, it's pretty pedantic. Those of us uh, deal with data all the time have to take a side. <laughs> you don't have to take a side. Um, so some more uh, definitions. Uh, a data set, a lot of people think of a data set as a numeric data set, and that's, that's valid. You might call it something else if it's not numeric. Data item, we say in our uh, repository, we call it uh, the object. The set of files that are updated at, under one project can be called a data set or a data item. Uh, maybe it's a bunch of uh, artworks. It doesn't really sound right to call it a data set. That's fine. Um, but my, my point for our, this is our, uh, every, every definition is an operational definition, right? It's for a, a certain purpose. So we, um, we use that definition for our digital repository to tell the researchers, okay, you can upload your data set, but the main point of this definition, it might be numeric, it might be encoded, like machine readable encoded. Um, but if it's a data set, it should be the numeric data set along with documentation. So it's not a full set, in other words, unless it's documented and has at least one documentation file, maybe a readme file. Um, but it, hopefully it has a lot of other documentation to make it reusable to other people. So metadata, you're all in the library field one way or another, so you've, you know what metadata is. It sounds strange to say R in that sentence. Um, so information about data in, in a repository, I guess, um, I think I took this from our definition for our repository, but uh, 
descriptive data, administrative data, usually conforms to a standard to allow interoperability. And, and a digital repository, you're all probably pretty familiar with digital repositories, even if it's not for data. You're probably familiar with publication repositories. Um, this is an early definition that I liked a lot um, because it, it is about depositing the content. Um, and then it's about the software architecture managing the content and the metadata. And, and then the basic services like put, get, search, and access control. And then if the repository is sustained, sustainable, trusted, trustworthy repository, then it ticks all the buttons and it's a very good digital repository. Uh, so I guess I haven't had a definition of RDM yet, but um, so here's one definition, the care and maintenance that is produced during the course of a research cycle. And we always, um, it's quite common to use these data life cycles. We'll go into it more in another section. Um, a research cycle or a data life cycle. And the reason it's, we tend to portray them in a circle is because if it's reused or reusable, then it might have another life. It's part of one research project and then it gets shared, preserved, and then it might become the beginning of a new research project by the same researcher or by different researchers. Um, so research data management, it should be an integral part of the research process. It actually probably always is. You know, we do a lot of like, you must do research data management, but everyone's doing it really, or else, or else they wouldn't be able to complete their research. Um, but they might not be very conscious of what they're doing, and they might not be doing things in an organized way that, that helps them um, do what they need to do. And then they might not be sharing it for others to be able to use. So that was the, the wordy definition, and this is more of the, all the kinds of things it might involve. So it's about, research data management is about planning in advance, planning and, and descri descri describing the, the type of data management you're gonna do during the project, thinking not just about the research question that you're gonna answer, but how you're gonna manage that data throughout the project. That might be new to some people that think about that consciously. Um, documenting the data, rather than just doing the analysis on the fly, uh, a lot of pull down menus and buttons to do the analysis and boom, I've got my result. Well, that's not very reproducible. So you have to put in, t take the extra time to document the steps you take to transform the data. Um, for yourself and for others. Choosing standard or open file formats where possible. Uh, so an, an, an example of a, a standard is, uh, um, I'll say JPEG. Hopefully I'm not controversial. Kevin will correct me if I'm wrong. I'll say JPEG is a standard and an open file format may not be, sorry, uh, it might not be a standard um, format, but it is, it is at least open, so it's unlikely to become obsolete. Uh, so, uh, in my understanding, PDF is, is an open format. So, they've, they've published how PDF works. People can um, build tools around PDF other than the Adobe company. Other people can do things with PDFs, but it's not actually an official standard. It is proprietary. It's a, it's a company, it's a company, uh, own format. Um, so both of those, but no one's going to ignore PDF because it's so common. So it becomes a de facto standard. Uh, storing data safely during a project is a big part of data management. Um, I brought my presentation on a, on a flash drive. Um, but if that didn't, if that hadn't worked, then at least I also had my laptop with me. And if that hadn't worked, I had it on my network storage, and if that hadn't worked, I should have, I actually didn't, but I should have emailed it to Dr. Ors last night so that she had a copy too. 
and that would have been good um, storing data safely. Um, depositing data in a trusted archive at the end of the research, creating metadata records for the data sets, and then licensing them appropriately, linking the publications to the data sets, um, and also the, the code, as we'll talk about, any protocols. So increasingly underpinning all of these things with PIDs, persistent identifiers, um, or PIDs, if you really want to be geeky, um, and, and maybe data access statements as well. So there's quite a lot to it, especially as we get more interconnected and standardized and all doing things the same way. Um, so what are the drivers for RDM? You, this is probably, uh, the librarians here are pr probably quite familiar with this already, but um, so open science, and uh, at our university we say open research because we want to include the humanities and arts people who don't consider themselves scientists. Um, apparently open science comes, I, I think it started in the German word, uh, Wissenschaft, which is knowledge or science interchangeable. Uh, in English, it sounds like science, not other kinds of research. So we say open research, either they're interchangeable. Um, uh, so th I thought this was a very nice quote from uh, people in our university, and th this is an open research strategy that the, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences came up with. So they are um, sort of champions within our university trying to push the agenda for open research. And you saw the word rigor in there, um, which we'll hopefully uh, talk about a bit more as well. So this is a very nice graphic by uh, Danny Kingsley and Sarah Brown, some librarians. Um, I think Danny Kingsley's now is in Australia. But um, this shows all the different kinds of open science benefits, as you may be familiar with. Uh, so, so that's kind of worded funny, but basically the idea that people from all different countries and from all different income levels can access the work rather than uh, just the, the richer research institutions that can buy all of the subscriptions. And of course, even the richest institutions can't buy all the subscriptions. So um, if we have a, more of the publications in open access format, then everybody can read them. Uh, individuals can get more exposure for their work. Practitioners can apply your findings to the real world. You can get higher citation rates. Your research can influence policy the public can access your findings, compliant with grant rules, because um, I'm not sure about India. Maybe I'll learn during this conference uh, how strict the funders are about this kind of thing, whether they have rules before they give out grant money about uh, research data management. And then, the, the, of course, whenever there's uh, public money being given out for research, then the public has an in interest. Uh, it becomes a public good. So as well as the article, um, the taxpayers are getting value for the money because uh, one of the reasons the funders started um, pushing this is if an experiment was done, a publication was made, say, uh, and the research, the data was not saved. So if someone was good to build on that research, they had to collect the data again. Uh, and sometimes that's not very efficient. Sometimes it is faster to run the experiment again, but uh, a lot of times it's, it's not efficient to create the same data over and over again. So obviously the funders don't want to pay for that. The public doesn't want to pay for that. So get it into the repository so people can reuse it. So a lot of benefits. Doesn't mean people want to do it, but, um, and, and I like this definition from a, a European Union project, Foster. Um, it's the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute. Where research data lab notes and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. 
We talked about open research before. Uh, definition part two. So open access publication, certainly. Open data, yes, please. Um, but then it, it might also involve these other things. And this may come out in the course of the conference if you're staying on for the next few days. Things like open peer review, maybe. Things like changing the reward process so it's not just publish or perish for the researchers, but they get career rewards for being data producers. Um, it's speeding up research, like I, like I was just saying, if, if the data is already there, you can take someone else's data and move on to the next stage of the res of uh, the science rather than starting from scratch. And increasing public access to research. This is more and more expected. We have an educated public. They want to be citizen scientists. They want to do crowdsourcing. They want to participate in um, in the research and the solutions for things like climate change. So um, by making uh, all of the infrastructure public, people can contribute in, in some cases, especially ecology, things like that. So, um, so this is an image about open data in particular. And uh, I think I feel an exercise coming on because I've been doing a lot of talking and um, we're going to try a diff couple different ways to put it back, you know, make this more interactive so you, you can uh, know you're learning something. And so this is a similar kind of um, slide to what I showed before. This is particularly about data. So let me see if I see anything in here. We talked about efficient research, um, new research made possible. The, on the public side, we have a lot of, um, you know, uh, misinformation going around it was very uh, obvious during the pandemic um, that misinformation is is a big um, big issue. So we we need to have public trust in sci science. So the more transparent the scientists can be, the more likely that will happen. Um, and we want to have the research papers validated. There's sometimes you hear in the news about fraud, uh, scientific fraud, and um, so if the data are val validated, then that helps to prevent that. I think we talked about everything else. OK, so get to know your neighbor. Choose, choose someone nearby. Uh, to, um, double up into pairs. And I'll go back to that image. And uh, OK, so especially for the librarians among you, imagine yourself convincing a researcher about why open science is a good thing and they're, they're not having it. I've always done it this way. I'm not going to change. Uh, look at the diagram. Look for some ideas. Um, what do you think would work when you're talking to that researcher? Uh, what, have, what has your experience been? Maybe you've done this. Um, so we'll give you five minutes. Find your neighbor. Just have a little chat. Uh, and. I will interrupt you in five minutes.
Okay, about 10 seconds. Finish your sentences. <laughs> Okay, thank you for participating in that. This always happens. Just everyone starts getting going and then I have to interrupt. Um, so, were, were these benefits persuasive? What concerns might researchers have? That might be the kind of thing you spoke about. Um, did any of, any of these concerns turn up? I see someone's happy to... Uh, speak back there the, the woman in the back Sorry. reproducibility or reinterpretation these are the benefits okay uh, i didn't hear the first word i heard reinterpretation reproducibility reproducibility and reinterpret and you, you felt that would that would persuade your imaginary researcher great did, did anybody have a, a more tr troubling thought? More concerns come up? Oh, yeah, I was thinking in the, this manner. See, if I'm collecting some primary data and uh, it involved a lot of cost, a lot of effort, a lot of time I have put in collecting that data. And if I have to share it with somebody else, see, my cost, effort, time, I spent on that. So, how will I create that thought process to share my data with somebody? Right. Um, yeah, so uh, that comes up here, competitiveness. And there is also one more thing, that misuse point. We both were discussing about the same thing. So, I am using that data and creating my own information and my own research paper on that. Mm -hmm. And if I am sharing that data with, uh, in the open source to somebody else, they may use, misuse it and create uh, the same information what I have created exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, this comes up. Um, anybody have an, another issue? Anything else uh, that came up here or, or in your own? Yeah, very good. Those uh, scooping, that sometimes they call it. I'll get scooped and someone else will publish before I have a chance to. Um, So some of these things, uh, uh, some of you may have talked about confidentiality. I can't share my data because I promised my subjects that it wouldn't be shared. Well, why did you do that? Uh, you were planning your research data management advance, so maybe you could have told them. Who owns the data here then? Who owns the data, yes. If at all uh, it is published by a particular in, uh, researcher who is working with an institute and then who owns the data maybe with the yeah. images as well as with the tabular in, uh, information that is being created yeah I, I mean I'm not necessarily gonna answer all these right now but there may be commercial concerns um, pat patent I, oh, and that might be patient there's another one that says patent I think um, yeah, ownership. Uh, we definitely, I've definitely heard that. Uh, these aren't my data. I got them from such and such. Well, I mean, we do have answers for everything because if it, if it really you don't own the data because you bought because someone else gave it to you, you could cite that data. You could ask for permission to share a subset of that. I'm, data. I'm from a medical institute, and okay. uh, the things are there are various uh, slides that are generated, uh, pathological slides that are generated and those are inserted in research papers. So in that case, whose data it is? Is it the researcher's data? Is it the institutional data? And what kind of copyright should involve in it? Okay, well, so this is where a clear institutional policy can really help. Uh, University of Edinburgh has a research day management policy. It, it, that it's published in 2011, um, and we just updated it for 2021. And so what we say is, uh, what do we say? <laughs> um, 
we, we go along the lines of the cop, uh, publications and copyright policy where um, it's actually quite a progressive policy where the institution says, unlike in the copyright law, the researcher can own their can own this object that they created under employment, but you can't give an exclusive license to a publisher for it. You, you have to let the university keep a copy. So that's one way to tackle it, um, or have the, let the university have rights in it. Or it may be just straight sort of copyright law. If, if you did the work under employment, then it, it belongs to the institution. When you said medical, I thought you might bring up the idea that the patients should own their own data and, and give permission. That's another issue. Um, and if we get to it, uh, we have some slides about consent and transparency of that. Another thing that sometimes comes up, you mentioned slides, medical slides. It might be the case, as with audiovisual data, that th the data themselves could identify the, uh, the patient in some way. Um, I've heard of brain scans that remove facial features something, I'm not a medical person, but um, to, it can, it, maybe it just cannot be anonymized or it takes too much specialized software like audio visual, um, you know, like on the news, they'll show, they'll pixelize people's faces in the background, but not everybody has that kind of sophisticated software to be able to do that. In that case, you might uh, publish a transcript instead, an anonymized transcript instead of the original. So there's a lot of concerns, um, legal issues, IPR, Maybe you know it's not documented well enough and you know it won't be uh, well enough understood. That, that again goes back to the planning. Can you plan to have enough resource for your project to make sure the data gets documented as you go so that there will be no surprises at the end? On the other hand, it, does it have to be perfect to make it publish? It's not the, it's not the research article. It's, it's only the, the data. If there's a few mistakes in it, is that the end of the world? I, I find, having done this for a while, that once a researcher shares data for the first time, they get over a lot of these fears. It just becomes something that you do as part of the research. And uh, so that's something to keep in mind. If you're starting out in your institution, try and get some champions on board. Um, try and seed your repository with a few volunteers. And then other people will say, oh, so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so over there did share their data. Maybe I could do it too. And then people will start looking at my stuff on, on the internet. Um, and, and maybe I'll get cited a bit more. So it's, some of it's kind of practice. And it's hard as a librarian um, to convince someone, I don't have a PhD, but um, to convince someone who is very learned and has been doing this for a long time. But they start to hear it from their peers and they start to see other people are sharing their data and they want, they want to try it too. But there are a lot of concerns there, and they are uh, not trivial concerns, but there are some techniques and, and some things are known about how to overcome some of these. Um, thank you for doing that. Oh, so, so this is a slide. The last time I prepared a similar workshop, um, I went to a conference in the International Digital Curation Conference in 2020. I think it was February 2020. It was the last conference I've been to before this one in person. Um, and they, there was a poster there that covered exactly this uh, from Japan. And they, they surveyed their own researchers and they asked them about their concerns. And, and so the number one concern here is that people would use it without citation. Um, so 58% of the researchers had a concern about that. And then you can show down the list, uh, certainly misuse, plagiarism, falsification, misunderstanding and misuse is a high concern. Um, and it, a, a, a small majority it, admit, minority admitted it might reveal a mistake and they're afraid of that. So all of these things, they are real concerns. And I, I, think, I think it's just a matter of getting in the habit of doing it. and. A lot of these things get overcome. That, that's just my personal view. Um, so it's nice to sh have evidence and survey findings to back that up. Uh, so going on to another driver for RDM, 
um, is research integrity. So conducting research in such a way that allows others to have confidence and trust in the methods and the findings of the research. We mentioned rigor before. Uh, it relates both to scientific integrity and, and the professional integrity of the researchers themselves because sometimes, sometimes there are fraudsters out there trying to get get a lot of grant money, get rich, get famous. <laughs> I don't think it's very common, but we, we do know it happens. Um, so you have to conduct the research with integrity. And the main thing to say about that is that all sounds fine and well, but it, what it really means is when you think about what the opposite is, it's research misconduct, which these are not things, you know, we, we tell our students, these are not the kinds of things you want <laughs> to get pinned on you early in your career. Um, so you need to establish good, good methods, good practice to avoid getting accused of fabrication of your data. What if, what if you lost your data and then someone challenges your results? So, oh, well, I, I promise I didn't make up the data, but I lost the data. That was years ago. I don't, I don't have that computer anymore. Um, so you could get accused of fabrication. Uh, using other people's material without credit, well, that's plagiarism, we know. Um, falsification, surely no one does that. Cooking the books and changing the numbers to get a significant result, surely not. Um, and then he, this, we have some medical people in the honest breach of duty of care. That's a very big one. Uh, breach of confidentiality using uh, research without their consent, failing to disclose conflicts of interest in peer review. By the way, I, I, I copied all these from our, uh, our university at, uh, research office. So they're very familiar with all these things. But to me, it's just a bit theoretical because I haven't met any fraudsters no, that I know of. Um, yeah, so. And then, and then if, if you do have allegations of misconduct, how do you handle that? You know, ho hopefully you say, open book, here, here's my data, it can be scrutinized, but you might deal with that improperly and then it looks like a cover up even if, even if it wasn't improper. Uh, reprisals against whistleblowers. So what is your institution doing to, okay, I keep going over to the keyboard when I have my things, so I have to remember. Um, so I think that's the interesting way to think about research integrity is you don't really want to be in any of those categories at all. But then you have to think about how to avoid that or being seen to be those things. Okay, so research integrity, there's a couple other things. I talked about data loss. Um, so if I start with the right hand part of the slide, without sustainable access to the underlying data, the research conclusions are imperiled. Um, and now what this research, it's back in 2013, so hopefully things are starting to change for the better, but they found that 80% of scientific data was gone in 20 years. Um, so the article got published, 20, they, they looked up articles from 20 years ago and said, can we have your data? We wanna check your findings. And people could not find their data. Uh, it's big, if you, if the authors are in charge, I mean, think about it. Are researchers experts in digital preservation? No, they're experts in their field. They, they should leave digital preservation to the librarians, the repository managers. Um, so they didn't have them uh, 20 years later. And it, it probably makes sense to you. I mean, how much data do you have from 20 years ago from previous computers, um, from your personal life even? So this underscores the need for intentional management of data and opened up converse, conversation on potential roles for librarians. So data loss really can't be denied. We're, we're quite, I feel like we're quite far along at University of Edinburgh. We have repositories, people are using them. We have 3,000 data sets uh, deposited over the last 10 years. All the, all the different schools have deposited, um, but there's still data loss, come on. It, we know it happens. Um, and then on this side, is there a reproducibility crisis? Was another bit of research from 2016. 
1,500 scientists admitting, yes, 52%, yes, a significant crisis, and 38%, yes, there's a bit of a crisis. Um, so only 3% said, no, there's no reproducibility crisis. And there's, we've seen these articles that say, I tried, we tried to reproduce all these results from the random sample of articles, couldn't do it. And that's not because it was all fraud. It's just because we, we're not quite there yet with open science and making these things able to be scrutinized. 7% didn't know, I, and that's fair enough because it's not talked about a lot. Um, so what about reproducibility? Uh, this is, I, I really like this slide from uh, a UK um, informatician, Carol Goble, who kindly let, let me use this slide over and over again. Uh, so she calls it the five R's. Um, so if you rerun uh, an experiment, say, um, then you can get re robust results. Um, if you repeat the same experiment, the same setup and the same lab, then you can defend your results. You know, this wasn't just a one-off. Every time we do this, we get these results. If, um, if you run the same experiment, the same setup with an independent lab, then you have, then you've replicated the findings and then that can be sort of certified that this kind of experiment will get this result. Um, she says reproduce is variations on an experiment on the setup and independent labs. So you can vary everything, but you can, you can reproduce the workflow and do something similar. And then you can compare the results. You might get different results, and then it's quite useful to see what the different results are, what the changes are. Um, and then reuse. Uh, you might use that workflow and change it to have a completely different experiment. But then you're, you're building on someone else's knowledge, and so it's knowledge transfer. So, it's, uh, so there's a difference between repeatability, which is about sameness and getting the same result, and reproducibility, which is getting a, a similar result. So she, that's the best I can do with that slide. She, she kind of can go on, go on about that, but that's pretty amazing to think about those different things. Um, and then researcher benefits, coming back to that. So by taking a managed approach to your data, someone, I remember someone pointed out uh, about your future self, you know, as a researcher, if, if, if any, any researcher who puts their uh, items into our Edinburgh Data Share repository, they can move institution, they can lose their laptop, it doesn't matter, they can go to a website and download their data documentation, everything that they wrapped up and, and bundled up to put in there, they can get it back. Um, so it minimizes the risk, they, people can build on their own research, they can demonstrate research integrity. They don't have to worry about all those nasty things on that previous slide. They, they're prepared for scrutiny of the findings. We welcome scrutiny and make compliance easy if the funders require these things. So re research and data are not the same thing, but better data generally leads to better research. So the last thing I'll say about this is um, if you, hopefully we're getting to a point where people love their data and they'll let it go free. This is kind of a strange thing that happened to me. I was, I was polishing my slides for a workshop and the photographer, the photographer down here at the moment, took a, that's me typing my slides and they took a picture from behind me and the, the picture itself is an example of what the saying says, which is, the coolest thing to do with your data will be thought of by someone else. Um, so that's a better use of that slide than I could have done. Um, but they used it for their purpose, and then I got a copy of it to use for my own purposes. So, it's, so that's an example of, of data sharing, and that's Rufus Pollock's quote from the Open Knowledge Foundation from Cambridge. So it's something to think about, like going back to the conversation with the researchers. 
if you say that to a researcher, you'll probably really freak them out because uh, they want to be the one to do the coolest thing with their data. But these things happen. I've, um, we had a science festival recently, and I, and I heard this example of this amazing um, uh, in, hi in history, a discovery, a physics discovery, and I can't remember the details. I'm not good at physics. But, um, but he, he performed this, uh, he, he got this unusual result that affected quantum physics and it affected all kinds of things. And at the time, he was asked, what is the significance, you know, not, not statistical significance, what is the meaning of, of that, of that um, occurrence? And he said, nothing, doesn't mean anything, you know, because the point of the experiment was this thing over here. But this side result ended up leading to all kinds of change. Um, so it's probably true, but researchers don't like to hear that. But if, if they really become champions, they might get comfortable with that. Um, so I think maybe we have time for one more section of data management planning or? Okay. Okay, so are you ready for data management planning? Um, thank you for bearing with me. It's quite a lot to get, go through. So we talked about the data life cycle. Uh, that's a simplified one that we use in our um, publicity and our brochures website create, document, use, store, share, preserve. Um, now, we don't have to always think of it as a life cycle, uh, especially for a researcher in a given project. A single project just really has a life course. Um, and once they expose it, as I said, it might become part of someone else's research cycle. But, uh, oh, I bet I can do this too. Um, so you can, you start off conceiving, designing. I think the color coding is uh, based on that cycle thing. So the, the things you do in the beginning are conceive and design. The things you do during the active phase of the project, you might experiment depending on what discipline. Experiment, analyze, collaborate. And then you, you publish your research and maybe you expose your data. And that's a nice image from uh, Monash University in Australia. And then on the top, it says what you're, so in the beginning, your data management planning, then you're using some kind of data management platform. And then when you publish and expose, you move the data into a repository and, and let those experts take care of your data when you're finished. if the data is ever finished. That's another issue. We were talking about dinner last night at dinner. Um, the, the data one has a nice life cycle. Their uh, environmental science project in the US. Um, so it looks very similar, but a bit more detail from the point of view of doing field research, where you're collecting the data. Uh, other, other fields, you might say create the data. If an experiment might be creation of data observational data might be collecting the data. You do some quality assurance on it, and then you make sure you describe it before you preserve it. Other people can discover, and then they might take a lot, maybe in that discipline, they're taking a lot of different data sets and integrating them together, uh, data integration, and then analyzing. So the basic principles is, uh, um, understanding why you need to plan, what the components of a good DMP are, using a tool like DMP Online, which is a free tool. And uh, this, my, my, my colleague's very good at adding uh, cartoons into her training um, for our researchers, so I've grabbed a couple of her cartoons. It happens to everyone. It has happened to everyone, right? Um, okay, so data management planning. What will it cover? Where and how you will store and back up your data. If, if you're storing it on managed network drives, centrally provided maybe by your institution, then maybe you don't have to back up your data because it's done for you as part of the infrastructure. Um, uh, we, we noticed in a survey recently that 
uh, researchers didn't know whether the data was backed up or not. But they didn't have to know, in a sense. They should know to, so they can put it in their plan. But um, it is backed up. There's a, it's on a 30-day cycle, et cetera. Um, how, how it will be shared with collaborators, that's a good thing to think of in advance. Who owns the data question? If you have collaborators, who has, act, who has rights to the data? And the steps required to anonymize any sensitive data it has to be thought of in advance before you collect this sensitive data. Otherwise, not a very good steward of the data. Um, when, how, and where your data will be preserved and shared. So to me, that's the number one reason to plan, to do, write a data management plan, is so that you know how you get to that end point of sharing at the end. So in order to share, I need to do consent this way. I need to um, document that way. I need to have, maybe I need to have 20% uh, of this postdoc's job to be data manager. Otherwise, it won't get done. Um, lost USB stick, that's, I actually saw that on Twitter. Um, See, I've seen it more than once, this kind of thing. It's very sad, a whole PhD getting lost. Uh, hopefully that's happening less and less often. And to be honest, I think the cloud helps too. People are having uh, cloud services backing up their data for them. Um, so it improves, uh, having a DMP improves efficiency and effectiveness, validation of results the ability to share data, it also avoids these terrible things, hardware failure, software glitches, accidental deletion and corruption, media degradation, the drive just dies. Um, or, and this does happen, everyone who's a librarian here knows, fires happen, to, flooding happens in libraries. Um, it all happens sometimes. Uh, has it, has any of this happened to you? Show of hands. Kevin has a lot of experience back there. It's, it's all happened to him. Uh, so writing DMPs can help you do all these things. That might be a little bit repetitive from what I said before. Is there anything new there? Um, developing procedures, especially if you're working with other people. How are we going to do the file naming together? When we create new files, how are we all going to act in the same way? Um, and I, it's a lot of work at the beginning, but it should make the, your lives easier towards the end. And then a funder's view on data management plans. Um, uh, this is Horizon 2020, the European Union funder, and they've moved on a bit um, to, a, to a new program. But this is, how, this is an early slide when they started requiring data management plans. And now they do, it was started as a pilot and now they just do it across the board. Uh, so the data management plan should describe the data the research will generate, how to ensure its curation, preservation and sustainability, and what, which parts of that data will be open and how will it be open. Uh, and, and this is important for researchers to realize is usually Often, with bigger funders, larger funders, the data management costs are eligible for funding. So don't feel like uh, you can't put it in your grant. And it, don't feel like if you put it in, or a lot of researchers will say, well, I can't make my grant any more expensive than it already is, or it'll be turned down. That's not necessarily true. If, if the research is worth doing, it's re worth doing well, and the, the funders have policies where they will pay for those costs. So another reason to plan those costs in the beginning so you don't get surprised with them. Uh, if you have big data, if you have sensitive data, you probably will have costs. Um, and they don't say you have to deposit in a particular repository. You can deposit where you want. And I call that academic freedom. Uh, let the researcher uh, make their own choices about how to manage their data, but just the expectation they will. So these are the components about, about the data, know what data you're going to collect before you collect it, documentation, um, and metadata, storage backup, ethical and intellectual property considerations, 
which data will be preserved. It doesn't have to be all of it. Um, maybe only the final results, maybe the anonymized survey rather than the raw data. Um, and then how you deliver the plan should also be included. Ideally, a DMP can be just short and sweet, but if it's a it's probably going to be more complex the larger the project is. Um, hopefully, researchers are starting to come to librarians for advice, and, uh, and librarians are starting to get practice with providing that advice. Um, if there's ethics, there's different things. We have something called a data privacy impact assessment. If there's personal data involved, and that should be consistent with the DMP or else it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the DMP ideally is a living document, but it isn't always because people have this requirement at the beginning to do it. In an ideal world, it would be a living document changing, but the point is it is a plan, so things do change but the plan helps make better research at the end. And then make sure all your team members are on board and people at different institutions. You might need a, a data use agreement to agree how the data will be shared amongst you. Um, things like a university policy can help if there is one. Uh, getting the right relationship to the ethics applications so they're harmonized. Um, participant information sheets and consent forms. You may not need consent to share the data if it's anonymized, but you might need to tell them in the participant information sheet that it will be uh, shared in an anonymous way and let them opt out now that they know that. Um, and journal requirements increasingly, uh, we get a lot of deposits in our repository because the journal is making them uh, share the data and have a DOI for the data set. Or if not a DOI, maybe a data access statement that says more than data are available at this email address. Um, so DMP Online is, is a free tool that anyone in the world can use. It's uh, um, the DCC is the Digital Curation Center, it happens to be based in Edinburgh. Um, but you can also have sophisticated um, institutional subscriptions and that's how they make their money from it where you can customize it for your institution but any individual can log in and make a plan and uh, we have a little exercise to try out DMP online um, do you think we have time to do this before the break or okay so I'll maybe leave this slide up and when you come back from the break you can you can try this you can um, just go in and register on, at that address. Uh, try picking a template and guidance and see what happens when you start going through pretending you're writing a plan. Or if you don't feel like doing that, find the public list of plans and to have a look at some of the plans that have been made available for others. So this, this isn't brand new anymore. So people are, there's more examples out there for people to share. DMP online. See if you can register an account. Hopefully it's quick and easy. And then take a look. Choose a funder template. Um, choose some guidance. Pretend you're writing a plan or go look for some of the public plans. OK, so just to. Uh, wrap up on data management plans. A uh, bit more complicated slide um, to do with, you know, maybe I should just take this off. No, I can't take it off. Um, the same data life cycle just with a bit more hints about the type of thing that goes in. Um, so you might want to also be adding a what kind of software you're going to be using for the analysis. Um, if you can get that far, what your file naming practice will be, structure versioning, quality assurance process. And then over here on document and use, this is the kind of day-to-day -day management of data. We, we, um, in our service, we, we differentiate quite a lot between the active phase of the research and the 
um, and the long term, the preservation side. Um, you know, if a researcher says, where can I store my data? The first thing we would say to them is, do you mean during your project or after your project is finished? Because it's different. Um, so this is the platforms, the really, um, the things that help the researchers be more productive in their research, um, but also the things that will help down the line, like documenting the data, defining the variables, not just having a spreadsheet with some acronyms at the top of every column, but another file that explains what all those <laughs> acronyms are, um, and what the values inside the spreadsheet are maybe a data dictionary, and then um, using the data, making sure you're following uh, data security so that only those who should have access do have access to the active data, how you transfer that data or share with your research partners. Do you need to encrypt the data while you're working on it because it's personal data? Um, so storage for active data, you, you know what the backup procedure is, what the disaster recovery procedure is, even if you don't, you're not doing it yourself. Um, hopefully you're not doing it yourself with USBs and external hard drives because they could fail. Um, and then over here on the preservation side, making the data publicly available where possible at the end of the project, license the data, any restrictions on sharing or access controls and preserve. So which data will be preserved? Um, select the data to keep. Maybe you throw away the rest or maybe you zip that up for um, and just keep it for a certain amount of time and then get rid of it. You know, you have to think about things like do you, will you scan the consent forms to save them? How long do you need to retain those? Uh, yeah. So everything to do with the preservation side. Oh, use my, and we caught up with ourselves pretty well. So, um, and I even have, if we do go faster than I expected, I even have some bonus slides, but I, I don't think it will because we've only got an hour left um, with a bunch more topics. So I hope you enjoyed the break. I did. I love Indian tea. Um, so, documentation, metadata, code, and RDM tools. And I just found some pretty images for you about data. Um, so this is the new section. Okay, so a lot of people say documentation, metadata is the same thing. I don't, personally, I don't really think of it that way. I think of documentation, maybe because my background is as a social science data librarian, but um, I think of documentation as the human readable stuff that contextualizes the research outputs and processes so that the user can understand how you got your findings and or how the data can be repurposed. So we talked about a data dictionary for all the value labels and variable labels. Um, maybe there's a readme file. So if, if a user came to our repository and downloaded a typical data set, Unlike a publication repository, which typically has one PDF per item, which is the research article, there's going to be many files. And sometimes there's zip files within other files, um, uh, files within zip files that get deposited. And there may be thousands of files. We allow up to 100 gigabytes to be deposited, um, 20 gigabytes with the drag and drop interface. and and then you can go larger if you work with someone on my team to do a batch import. So there's a lot of files. And so a readme file helps the user get started with where do I start? What are these files about? What are those files about? Things that end in this suffix, things that end in that suffix. Um, what is, if maybe there's a study protocol. Um, this is all human readable stuff that helps the human who's going to reuse the data, get to grips with it. Maybe it's the data is underlying a published report and um, the method, maybe the methodology statement is in the paper. Maybe the paper is part of the documentation. Like if you want to understand the data, read the paper, have a full methodology report there. 
Um, maybe there's a copy of it with the data in the repository, um, a copy of the methodology. Sampling, or maybe there's a link to the paper. Uh, sampling frame description, if, if, if that's relevant. So this is a textual or PDF form that a human can read. And then there's metadata that, you know, as we were talking about, it's, it's machine readable, it's standard, standardized fields that allow discovery through search engines, or if it, maybe it, the metadata is marking up the structure of the data set in, in a database, showing the, how the fields relate to each other. It's very computerish. Um, it's a, a, a certain software is needed to read it or it shows relationships between diff different digital objects like a DOI, a persistent identifier, a URL, which you click on and the machine actions that to go to that other um, site. So the format's often XML or JSON, which is not that it's possible to read it as a human if, if you're good at coding. It's not very readable, really. Um, and so examples, metadata, as you probably know, Dublin Core, the simple Dublin Core, or the more complex um, Dublin Core metadata initiative terms. Uh, Datasite has a schema, if you want a schema to use that's specifically about data sets. Uh, schema.org is another example for linked open data. And he here's some examples of some very scientific um, data sets. There's a lot in the biosciences that start with MI. I think Miami was the first one, a gene expression microarray. And so, so researchers don't like to create metadata, so they have this idea of the minimum information necessary for that data to be usable, um, which is a good idea because, yeah, you can spend all day uh, enhancing and enriching the metadata, but you have other things to do as a researcher. So what is the minimum? And if you can standardize that and say, this is what we need for the minimum. In fact, what we say in our repository is the minimum is the, the fields you need to create a citation. Um, so types of metadata, uh, descriptive, um, things that go into the citation, like title author, or we usually say data creator, abstract location, time frame maybe, and key, keywords for discoverability, whether that's controlled vocabulary or free text. Um, administrative data might be some of the preservation data that shows the audit trail, like this, Metadata, was, this data set was deposited on such and such a date. And if somebody else says that they created that data on a later date, you can prove it because you have the timestamp. Rights management, who has the right to access it or, um, or, or structural things about relationships. Okay, so just um, software code. Don't forget the code. Uh, we talk about data, 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 but um, sometimes a, a data set, sometimes the code is more valuable than the data set. But some of the, one of the um, most renowned uh, departments at our university is informatics. So the software code and the software models in that case are more valuable to them. The data is just some, some input that you use to create a better model. So maybe it's the, mo the model itself that's the important thing. Or maybe just uh, if you think of a regular straightforward data set that's showing results of a survey or an experiment, then it's, um, the code is showing how, that, how you got from that data input to your data output and how the data was transformed in the process. Sometimes if it's um, like a software package like SPSS, it's just uh, it's the annotations, um, or R. There's usually a way, like with an asterisk, or some way to comment within the code and say, okay, on this step, this is what I'm doing now. And a lot of people skip that, but it's, that's the kind of documentation that makes your data and code very reusable if you just say, what this next bit does is this. And something like a Jupyter Notebooks is quite use, useful for recording that kind of documentation within the code. Um, 
Another, another method is to keep a data log. So if, you're, if your data is being run several times and transformed through several uh, iterations to get your result, um, you might lose track. You, you might lose track of that in order for it to be repeatable or reproducible. So you could just keep set up a spreadsheet or a Word document with the names of the names of the files and just a short description of what changed in each file, and then you then you can retrace um, or explain how you got there or do it again. Um, and then if if you're if you're writing code from scratch, you might use a version control system like GitHub. Has, has anyone used GitHub? It's a, a cloud. Anyone heard of GitHub? Okay, more people have heard of it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cloud tool. You might know more about it than I do. Uh, um, a cloud tool that lets you upload the code and and then keep and then manage it within that system. Um, you can roll back the code if if you do something in the next version where you where it breaks it uh, that happens then then you can roll back to the previous version or if you like someone else's code and you want to um, you want to expand on that and do something else then you can fork the code and say I'm using this code but now I'm going in this different direction I'm going to do something else with it and that's labeled and it, it's quite a fantastic system for uh, I think there's been different types of these versioning systems in the past and they now have a killer app which is called github that just works for everybody i think um, and it's very good for keeping your code open source and shareable um, but you can like this git company um, university of edinburgh runs a git instance on our own servers and then people can uh, have private versions as well or maybe you want to keep it private until it becomes public or maybe you're not making it public. Um, but so considerations about code. Maybe it's part of the documentation of the data, if it's the data results that are important, or maybe it's the code itself that's so important and you shouldn't use a data repository, you should use a code repository, um, something like GitHub. But basically, it's just about not forgetting the code and then trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so tools for research data management, I don't think we have, well, maybe we have a killer app. Maybe some of the electronic lab notebooks are a killer app. It doesn't have to be lab. Um, a lot of these things cross over different disciplines. It might, they're kind of called electronic notebooks or digital notebooks because it doesn't have to just be the lab. It might be a workflow where you're scraping data from the web. There's nothing to do with a laboratory, but you want to keep track of a process. Um, so traditionally, paper lab notebooks have been very effective, and they're very good at that kind of audit trail to see how, what was done in the experiment and the timestamps and the annotation. And people are very good at annotating when they can just write it. But it, so it takes advantage of, um, of that effectiveness of the lab notebook in paper format and puts it in digital form. The trouble is there's a lot of products on the market for lab notebooks or digital notebooks. And this is an example of uh, Harvard did a study, you know, I guess to choose um, which one to use. And the, of course, it's always changing. So this, if you go to that site, they might even say it's out of date now. But um, there's a whole matrix of comparing features. But basically, find one that works for you and your group your research group and uh, and use it and then get in the habit of using it and uh, data portability is very important you don't want to get locked into a certain product and the product goes bank the company goes bankrupt and you lose your data so make sure you know how you can get the data back out again maybe an XML format or in worst case maybe PDF format um, and usually there's a, oftentimes there's a free version, like University of Edinburgh has a contract with R space, for example, just one of, it's one of these. And uh, so the, the research groups can buy licenses. They can use the free version on the internet, kind of like DMP online. They can use the free version on the internet 
or the institution can you can get an enterprise version for a lab group or for a whole institution and then more features become enabled especially the sharing of areas for different users to work in a group and then we mentioned Jupyter notebooks so computational notebooks is the other thing if you're very statistical oriented these um, I think Jupyter is probably another killer app uh, that people really like and they might use R, they might use Python, they might use some of these newer data science kinds of um, coding tools um, and keep track of what they do in a computational notebook. Okay, so that was it for the nitty gritty stuff. Pretty uh, quick section there, so we're moving right along. Um, open data licenses and data citation probably one the library subject the librarians like more um, uh, let's see so I'm quoting myself guilty guilty as charged um, yeah so it's just sort of common sense um, it hasn't really been done traditionally like you a lot of the older articles you can just see if you see a chart in the middle of an article uh, you often see this kind of thing, OECD 2018. Um, do you know how many data sets the OECD produces? Like hundreds and hundreds probably. Uh, so that doesn't really help you find the source. So you need a full proper citation to find that source if you're using someone else's data. Um, so that's really the point there. You need enough detail about the data that you're using so that someone else could go find it and, and do the same kind of thing with it. And um, this is a slightly older article that was quite good, uh, written by scientists. Uh, 10 simple, it's kind of a lighthearted approach, 10 simple rules for the care and feeding of scientific data. And so they, they have these 10 rules and so I, I picked out these that all have to do with citation. Um, so share your data online with a permanent identifier. That's that PID we were talking about, persistent identifier, like a DOI, digital object identifier. And there are DOIs that can get minted specifically for data sets, although they're not free. And they're, um, you, yeah, you have to go through an organization like data site. We go through the British Library uh, to get our DOIs minted. Uh, the handle system's a lot cheaper, actually. It's um, uh, $50 to belong to, to be able to mint handles, and then uh, $50 a year. And you can mint as many as you like. So if, if you have, like, machines that are uh, experimental machines, scanners and things that are going to put out a whole lot of data, you're going to really create a zillion data sets, then the cost of a DOI might matter to you, so you could use handles instead. Um, anyway, share the data, use a permanent identifier, or permanent or persistent. Persistent's a better word because is it permanent? It, it, there still needs to be some effort involved to keep it persistent. Link your data to your publications as often as possible. Um, so in other words, cite yourself. Everybody wins. The readers can find the data and you get more credit. Uh, state how you want to get credit. So cite as follows, for example. Um, or sometimes people say, if, if you reuse this data set, that's fine, but cite my paper. Because you get more credit for your paper citations than for your data citations. Uh, until we get to this perfect open science world where everyone gets credit for their data sets. Um, and reward colleagues who share their data properly. So if you do borrow someone's data, cite it properly. Oh, this is where I have a film clip. You ready for a film clip? Someone else talking besides me. Um, let's see if it works. the sound will, it'll have sound. Oops. Okay, where am I? Come on. 
दर्शन प्लीज कमेड cite data correctly much in the way that you would cite um, an article a website or an image two reasons to cite data correctly the first is that it's an acknowledgement of a primary source that's being used in research so it's good scholarly practice to cite data in the same way that you might cite a book as a primary source the second reason is for research funders to be able to track the use of the data that they support people want to go back and look at the analysis that's been done unless you know where the data sets come from then you're not sure that the analysis has actually been done correctly this is the foundation of social research and of research in general and it is about finding the truth finding the patterns people can build on what you've done so they're more likely to cite you and that's really good for you as a researcher as you're developing your career and your research it's quite a simple task to cite data correctly so the uk data service provides a kind of copy and paste function DOI is a digital object identifier and every data set should have this. The DOI is a web address which will never disappear, it remains constant. It is like a, a fingerprint, it's made up of a string of letters. The first part is uh, references the publisher, for example the UK data service has a number. The second part is the name of the data collection. The next part is the version. It's kind of like if you lose your bank card. You still have your account number, you don't lose that. Same with the data set. If the data set moves, you still have the DOI to identify the data. It allows the funders to get visibility of who's using the data that they've supported. If there wasn't the funding available, ESRC's funding, for example, for Understanding Society, or even the UK Data Service itself, wouldn't be able to continue. So researchers have a really important role to play if they want the data that they rely on to continue to be made accessible to them. But also, as a data producer, studies like Understanding Society, we try to publicise research using our data because it demonstrates the value of the study. And so through our website and through our conversations with government departments, we would be telling them about your research if we know about it because you've cited our study. Keep it up for a later video, but we'll do that when the time comes. Okay, so UK Data Service um, have a lot of uh, state-of-the-art advice on things like that. Um, okay, so yeah, so Louise Corti there was talking about what's involved in a, in a DOI, but people use persistent identifiers in different ways. So she was kind of talking about how they use it. There is the publisher side and then a string after that. It may or may not have a version as, as part of the string, but this is just about the human readable citation. Um, and then the DOI in, in a sense is the machine version of the citation because it's machine actionable by clicking on it. Uh, but the, the human readable, at the minimum, and this is data site saying this, um, who provide the DOIs, so they're saying creator, we use, we use creator instead of author, but it's the same idea. Um, publication year, title. A lot of people don't know how to title their data set, which is understandable. Sometimes, sometimes they give it the same title as their paper, um, which may make sense, but it may not make sense. So. That's something to think about. Uh, and the publisher, who is the publisher? That goes back, I think, to an earlier question about who owns the data. In our repository, we ask, um, we generally have the, the format where 
people will put publisher for University of Edinburgh and then what school they're in and then if it's an institute like um, uh, like a typical library cataloging where you have the, the smaller unit up to the larger unit. But we say University of Edinburgh is the publisher, but the creator may be a, um, individual people. And if, if, the, if there aren't individual people, like for, it's the kind of data set where there, was, there wasn't a lot of human input and I just want to say that an organization was the data creator, then we, we usually leave the creator blank and just use the organization as publisher. And then if there is an identifier at the, oh, the identifier is like the persistent identifier, so the DOI at the end. And then uh, data site says you, you can add on to that by including version, if that's relevant, and resource type. It can be quite useful just to call a data set a data set in the citation, especially if it has the same title as, <laughs> as, the, um, as the parent publication. So, uh, and, it, and actually, a really good reason to include data set in the citation is um, Google data set search now, which is uh, a new, uh, one of the newer Google inventions. Um, it, can find, it can find repositories that have data sets, and then you can search within Google data set search. And instead of having to rule out all the publications and the other things that come up, you're only searching on data sets. But it will only make things available if it's called a data set. So that's. And then here's an example from our, our repository. Um, this is a, la a landing page from our repository which describes a data set called Europe's National Natural Treasures and Illustrated Ecosystem Services Map. So this is one of our um, depositors who is really in it about the data. Like, I don't even know if there's a publication that goes with this, but he's really curated the data to be reusable. And it's from the geosciences. So we have a citation at the, the top. I think maybe it's gotten cut and pasted too many times. It looks blurry, but um, has the citation at the top, a description, which does describe the data set. Um, th it has, you know, half a dozen or more files. And we have this feature where you can click this button and say download all files and you get one big zip. And that's just something we added on to DSpace um, to make it work better for data sets. And some more metadata on the side, data available type, data creator. It's an image because the map is, the map looks like that. That's a thumbnail of it. Um, but then he has other files that explain it. and. The data, so there's about six data creators, and you can show the full item record and get more metadata. But this is kind of what most people need to decide whether they want to download the data set or not. And we have the alt metric button. So a lot, a lot of times that gets left blank because nobody's poor data set sits in the repository without ever getting cited. But if it does get cited, it gets uh, alt metric badge put on it. And then, by the way, we have, uh, it says the following licenses are associated with this item. So we have um, uh, a depositor agreement, which they may not read, but it, we're just, and we're at, we're, we're, at, we're at their same institution. So we're all University of Edinburgh. So it's kind of a nicety because we're legally, we're one institution, but we're kind of pointing out to them that they're handing over their data to the university or to us, the custodians. Um, and that we, we may do things to it. We may, we may take it down and remove it from the repository for some reason or other. Usually, we wouldn't. Um, we may change the content. That sounds scary, but what we're getting at here is just um, the actions we might need to take in the future for digital preservation. So if we want to migrate from, if a file bec uh, format becomes obsolete, we may want to change that into another format. Um, so we just kind of give them a little warning that we're kind of taking ownership of this data set. Are you comfortable with that? Um, and they get, of course, the benefits of being able to download it when they leave the institution. And there's an end user license as well, um, which might, which might just be Creative Commons um, license. So that leads us on to open licenses. 
um, and open data. So which are this kind of, that Edinburgh Data Share is an open access data repository. We do have tools for restricted access as well, but I won't go into that. But um, so here's, some de here's a definition of uh, open from that Open Knowledge Foundation again. Uh, open means anyone can freely access, use, modify, and share for any purpose, subject at most to requirements that preserve the provenance um, of where the data came from and the, op and the openness, you know, some like those share alike licenses where uh, it has to be shared in the same way. Uh, or put most succinctly, open data and content can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. And there's similar definitions from other bodies and initiatives. And you might have your own. I have one from UNESCO in the notes, but I don't think I'll bother reading that because I have to come out. Um, so how many people are familiar with Creative Commons? Yes. So quite a few. If you're, if you're not, I'm going to go through it. Um, they talk about uh, flavors of Creative Commons. So this is another, I think this is a killer app for open licenses. Um, we, in the early days of the repository, we had people coming to us who had worked out with their lawyers this huge long terms and conditions for their data set and gave us these things. Or sometimes they put the terms and conditions in the header of the file. And so when you download it, and then you read the header that you can use it for this, that, and such and such, and not for this other thing. And um, Creative Commons is hugely simplified licenses, which is a legal thing. And so nobody enjoys reading legal fine print, especially on the internet. So it's it's great, and it's great for uh, other things besides data sets. But um, we use it for data sets, and it basically comes in like these four, what they call flavors. So the, the picture of a human, and or they call it by, like this data set is by so-and-so, this human. So that's the attribution license where the human wants to be acknowledged that it's their data set. Non-commercial. So um, you can use it as long as you're not going to make money from it. Um, and then you can't use it. Uh, Non-derivative. Uh, so the equal, equal sign. So you have to use it in... Ex you can't change it and alter it and like, um, you know, do some kind of uh, mashup. You, you can't take the image and change colors or do something weird with it because the person who, who owns it wants to keep the integrity of it. Um, so you can use it as long as you don't change it. And sometimes artworks are done that way. Um, or share alike, SA. So, you, you can use it and republish it, but only if you share it exactly, use the exact same kind of license we're using, um, which I find quite problematic, actually, because we, we created an open training resource, and the sh we didn't want to make it share like we wanted the buy, um, attribution only. And whenever we had a resource that used share alike, them and, and embedded it within the learning resource, we would have had to share alike the whole, our whole resource because of their share alike license. So we just didn't use any of those. We just had to keep searching for a better image until we found one that suited our license. And this is what they look like when you start combining them. Um, so they have the little initials, which you start to memorize when you use them, CC by ND, non-derivative, and, um, and, and then they also have the pictograms that you, you can really, once you learn it, you can just see at a glance and whether it suits you or not, and you can choose whether to use it or not. You could, you could probably use it, but you can't republish your own work with it unless you can abide by that license. Um, yeah, so making it easy for humans and computers to reuse data. And so they have different versions. So they have, if you go unpack what is in the license, there's a legal code with real lawyers came up with this. Um, and it, it might be dif different jurisdictions. So each country might have 
a CC um, set of CC licenses, or you can use the international version, which supposedly is able to cross jurisdictions. Um, there's the human readable, which says you can do this and you can do that. And then there's the machine readable, so that, you know, this is really getting into interoperable data where um, machines could go out and find a resource and, and include it and know that it's, uh, I mean, I suppose one way that I do that is when I was searching for some of the images to use in this presentation, I might use um, a Google search, turn on images, and then go into the advanced search and say, only show me uh, openly licensed content. And then Google, there's no humans behind, I mean, there's humans behind Google, but there's no humans figuring that out for you. It's a, they, they can read the license. If they're using Creative Commons license, then they can immediately include that in the set. Um, the computer can do that for you. Okay, so now I have a, a, controversy, a contra controversy for you. Bearing in mind everything that's just been said, go back to your pairs or three, three people um, or whoever you find and debate or agree on an answer to the following question. Is, oh, CC, yeah, is CC non-commercial actually an open license? Um, because is it, because the definition said free for anyone to use for any purpose, but we're banning commercial use. So is that's debatable. Is CCNC an open license or is it not an open license? Um, so I'll give you a couple minutes. There is no right answer, but it's an, I think it's an interesting question and you may have a view. And I'm going to ask you what you think at the end, so you have to come up with a view. Two minutes. Okay. Thank you for participating. Um, okay. Who believes CCNC is an open license? Hands up. And then I'll pass out the mic. Who believes CCNC is not an open license? Hands up. Oh, we have some undecided people. Should have given you more time. Um, okay, who would like to argue the case that CCNC is not an open license? Even though it's from the Creative Commons, the maker of open licenses. Anybody? Anybody feel strongly about that? Nobody wants to argue this. Okay. Uh, the reason I feel is uh, it is uh, non-derivative. You cannot change it. You have to use as it is and uh, you cannot share it. So I don't feel that if at all it, you, uh, if at all things in open, license the changes can take place uh, you can share it and hence i feel that it uh, ccnc is not an open license okay that that sounded like a argument also that the non-derivative is not an open license which is arguable too anybody want to argue that cc cc non-commercial is an open license even though it bans commercial use. Volunteer? Even though, uh, suppose I create any material which I'm claiming that it is a CC, share alike, and non commercial. I feel that. Uh, my uh, thought process of generating this particular data is uh, it should be openly accessible and available to everyone. I am giving right to anyone who is using my material, use it commercially. So uh, with that concept of open license is intact. So I feel that uh, it is fair to keep uh, your data with uh, the tag called uh, non-commercial. Okay, thank you.
So I don't know if anybody noticed, but I've made my slides CC by MC. So <laughs> I said we're going to circulate the slides afterwards. So that means you can download them, you can read them, you can learn from them, um, you can share them with your friends. And but if you if you put them on the internet or uh, copy them, if you make copies for your friends, I guess, then you you want to tell them you got them from me. Thank you. And uh, and you want to tell them. Uh, but please don't go and make money on it because um, Robin wants to get invitations to, to go around the world and give her a workshop. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, yeah, I'm not sure why I did that. It, sometimes I feel guilty because I'm not sure if I agree that NC is a true open license. On the other hand, as we heard, even non-derivative, saying you can't change it, that's not very open. Even having to attribute it maybe isn't very open because, uh, you know, let your data go free. Um, but I find that if you're trying to talk researchers into sharing, they really, if nothing else, they want attribution. Um, it matters to them more than payment because, you know, that's their bread and butter. Yes? Okay, hang on. We're doing everything with the mic. Okay. Yes. Uh, CCNC, although I would like to argue it's not open source per se, but using that license, make sure your da data actually remains open. So let's say you have a really good data set and someone published a news on it. There is a good chance that news would be under a paywall. That's a commercial use. And uh, since uh, all the news networks will have way better SEO that is reached to the people, and your data behind, being behind a paywall, no one will actually access it. So CC, although is not exactly open, open source because it doesn't fulfill the any purpose clause, it is actually would be the best way to share your data. Okay, thank you. That's well thought through. Um, I guess something to keep in mind is you're still making it available for people to download. Even the commercial, people could learn from it even they just can't make copies um, to use for their own profit but I we also try to convince our researchers to put as few stipulations as possible in fact we only offer one flavor in our repository which is CC by and we give them we give the user a suggested citation as you saw to make it easy for them to do the right thing and cite the data and uh, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, but we tell them, if, if you can put on these other licenses, and you, and you can even put on those terrible terms and conditions in your own words or your lawyer's words. But do you really think, you know, in the age of the Internet that, that we have now, is anyone going to read that? And we're not going to police it for you. So there is a sense of you are letting it go wild a bit. If, if you know you're putting it on the internet. So you have to become comfortable with people using it for different purposes. You know, it's probably not going to go viral in the wrong way or something like that, but anything, anything could happen. And um, it, as librarians, we're not going to police that kind of thing. So you have to be comfortable putting it on the internet. And not everyone obeys these exactly, and no one's suing each other over it either, really. So it's, um, it's an intention. It's an intention that's really not that enforceable once you put it free on the internet. Okay, um, so back to FAIR. Remember when I said FAIR data right at the beginning? Um, if you cannot make your data open, at least make your data FAIR. So how do you make your data FAIR? Findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Um, so the idea is open by default, make it open if you can, but um, for some of the reasons we talked about before, the, the legitimate concerns, especially uh, for human subject data, you can't always make it open. Um, so findable is, is something we can do. If, if everybody deposits the data in the repository, 
we, we have um, we, we have the know-how, we have the software, we have the metadata to make that data findable on the internet. And we might be able to make it accessible as well. Um, some of, the, some of the way we talked about some of the ways to make your data more accessible, use open formats or standard formats. Um, don't use this obscure software that nobody can buy. Um, put it into a format that is more common. Interoperable. So this is where uh, we saw that life cycle slide where people are integrating different data sets for their analysis. If you have controlled vocabulary for your discipline, use that controlled vocabulary. Don't make up your own. How can you make your data more interoperable for others to use? Um, reusable. Is your data reusable? Are your data reusable? Um, how can you optimize reuse of data? So one of the things um, we have, I guess, the luxury of doing with our repository is I have a small team of people um, who can uh, talk to the depositor about their deposit and say, can you give us more metadata? How about an abstract? How about a data dictionary? Because no one knows what those acronyms are for your variable labels. How about um, some subject keywords? How about a geographic place and time? Uh, when was the data collected and stuff? So they can kind of hassle the depositor a little bit and say, we're not quite ready to accept this. Can you give us some more information? And we can make, we can be like the proxy for the user and make the data as reusable as possible when they upload the data. Um, because why would we, you, you know that old, maybe you're all too young to remember the early days of the internet when they said um, garbage in, garbage out, or that's kind of an adage in computing actually. Um, we don't want our repository to be a dump of garbage, that non-reusable data. So we do take this extra step, and I'm grateful that our universities pay some staff time for us to be able to do that. Not everyone has that luxury to be able to check the data sets, quality assure them, and try and improve the metadata for the reusability. Um, so if you're going to make your data fair, you might as well deposit in a trusted repository. You've, already heard my bias about researchers not being experts in digital preservation. Give it to the experts. In this case, librarians don't like, to, I don't think we like to think of ourselves as experts, but, um, but in this case, we're the experts. We're, we're going to hold on to that data and try not to lose it and try to keep it accessible into the future. Uh, so this is some nice guidance um, wording from another service like ours the King's College London Research Data Management pages. And I just like the image and I like the wording of how they're talking to the researcher and making it be um, like we were talking, uh, I was talking with someone during the coffee break about, we, we may not be able to convince the researchers to practice open research, but, but we can be their trusted friend once they do decide because they're being pressured by others in their field or their funders then we can say, okay, I'm sorry you have all that burden to go through, but we can make it easier for you. We have this repository, all you have to do is upload it. Um, okay, so that's fair. And I'm going to challenge you to think about a data set that you know. This might, this might be a little hard, but a data set you know may be available on the internet. And how much of the FAIR principles does it meet? Um, so if you go to that website, you, you see the full, it's actually, there's, there's quite a lot of stipulations in there. It sounds, sounds very simple and it's a catchy phrase, but to, to have a quick look at the stipulations and then try and think of a data set you know of on the internet and whether it's absolutely completely fully FAIR or whether it kind of falls down a little bit so uh, I'll give you a couple minutes. Okay, I hope I haven't stunned you all into silence. 
um, hopefully you had enough time to read through and get a sense of how easy or difficult that is. I don't know if you, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I don't know if you thought of um, a data set. Would anyone like to share some thoughts? You think this is easy or difficult to achieve? Any, any thoughts? Okay, I've stunned you into silence. That's that's right. Um, I'll use I'll use my re remember that example of our of our uh, data set in our re repository. Um, there's quite a lot of things I think we're doing right in the repository, but I don't think we can do everything. Um, so I don't think we fully meet the fair requirements. I think it's quite difficult to do. Uh, um, okay, so. So, for example, metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. Is that true? I mean, that is also what's supposed to happen if you use a DOI or a persistent identifier. Um, for some reason, we had to, uh, even though we use DSpace, which is no, you know, known for doing, having these repository functions, that's what it's built for, we had to create our own tombstone method until until it became built into the software, where we, if, if we had to withdraw files, let's say, let's say they were breaching confidentiality or something, we had to remove the files, um, or maybe just simply the item was superseded by a newer version and we didn't want to make the old files available so people wouldn't use the wrong version by mistake. Um, uh, unless we had a, that tombstone record still with a landing page, like kind of forever, saying what used to be there when you go to that DOI, then that wouldn't comply with that. So that's tricky. And if people are sharing it themselves on a website, that's pretty hard to do, because then the, when the rep website gets taken down, it's gone. Um, what's another example? Um, so the, the data includes qualified references to other data, so you have pointers and DOIs to the, all the data that's relevant to the data. Um, the, meta, the data have associated with detailed provenance. We know we can follow the audit trail all the way through. The data me, domain relevant community standards, well, not always. Sometimes the standards don't exist yet or sometimes the researcher isn't aware of them or chooses not to use them. Um, and the, the other thing is every time it says data here, it has this meta in parentheses. So all these rules apply not just to the data, but to the metadata about the data item. So is there a persistent identifier also to the metadata um, about the item, or is it considered, the, in our repository, it's considered the same thing, the, the DOI that goes to the landing page. There's one DOI for the landing page, and that's the metadata, but it's also where you find the data. So we, we fail on some of these because um, they're hard to achieve, and Oops, back to my slides. And yeah, just all I'll, last words on that topic is um, even uh, Cliff Lynch is kind of one of my library heroes. I don't know if you know him um, from the US, uh, from California. And uh, no, he's associated now with um, uh, which organization? Oh, CNI, right? Center for Networked Information. It's such an old name. Um, so Cliff Lynch said at this same conference I was talking about, right at the beginning, before we really knew we were hitting, getting hit with a pandemic, you can't argue with the principles of fair data, but implementing it is hard. So if he admits that, then I don't feel bad saying that. It, it, implementing it all the way is quite hard. And one of the reasons it's hard is this guy, uh, Baron Montz, who's um, a medical researcher of some kind, maybe a data scientist also. Um, he has this part of the, the vision, he was one of the creators of the FAIR principles, and he has this vision that to really get um, science going, and medical science, when you think of uh, the important things that need to be done for diseases and things to solve all the medical problems, we need data science working at full capacity where Machines can go out and find the right data sets, merge them together, follow the license actions, 
um, be interoperable with each other. And this is all, like, I don't mean without humans, but it's programmed by humans, but that quite a lot can get done just by the computers with all that, without all that human readable stuff. And so if you think about going towards that as an ideal, there's certainly the, the data sets in our repository, I've talked a lot about making them human readable, under, human understandable, because generally they're downloaded one at a time by a thinking human. Um, but if we were to move to that model, that uh, it's particularly hard for us because we have so many disciplines in the repository. But something like gene databases, you can start to see it happening. So fair can also mean fully AI ready. It's just it's just quite a high bar to set. Um, and yeah, so I say uh, you don't have to deposit your data in a trusted repository to make them fair, but it sure helps. That's back to that message of deposit in a trusted repository because the, re this, the researcher can't do this by themselves. The FAIR principles are written as if the researcher can do it by themselves. They say, make your data FAIR. I say, put it in a trusted repository and, and mark it up the best you can. Okay, um, are, we, are we at a stopping point? Are we finished? I didn't get through everything, but uh, as I said, I would make everything available so you can read the rest on your own. Uh, Dr. Robin Rice, she has given the presentation on this research data management, the tutorial one. I think all the participants, they might have, everybody might have enjoyed these things, very informative, because she is also the data librarian and the head research data support information service, University of Edinburgh, UK. So I'm thankful to you, madam, for the, this is a nice presentation and the tutorial for this session. And uh, I think my all the participants might have enjoyed this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>